so now let's talk about what are the goals of therapy. Mary Frances, you want to help us with that? So of course when we treat any disease we would like to think our goal of therapy was to cure the disease and in my book that would be eliminating the acquired malignant clone um, but that is not what we are doing or we're not anywhere near that yet that may come up. Our main goal of therapy is to try to prevent thromboembolic events um, because that was what killed these people. The original study showed without therapy that 50% of people were dead within 18 months. That's with no treatment, no venous action, and that was m mostly because of thromboembolic events. So our first goal of therapy, as we talk of therapies, will be to prevent thromboembolic events. The other things we would like to do, but perhaps we don't have the tools to do that, would be to prevent progression either to myelofibrosis um, or acute leukemia. But actually our main goal in therapy practically is the prevention of thromboembolic events. Okay, and also uh, Ruben, uh, our expert on symptoms, you know, also symptom control uh, for the disease, but how do you manage PV when you first make the diagnosis? What is your management, uh, what agents do you have? Well, first, I think it's important for physicians to really view, you know, the management of PV as a chronic disease. You know, so as I, as I speak with patients and really try to have them wrap their head around, you know, having this chronic neoplasm, you know, they'll, they'll look on the web and they'll be thinking of, uh, of other cancers, breast cancer, colon cancer, et cetera, that have intensive cyclical therapy for a period of time. You know, here we're clearly talking about a long-term management to really try to make the disease as neutral in their lives as possible in terms of risk of thrombosis, in terms of controlling symptoms, ideally in terms of avoiding progression. So in terms of our current U.S.-based guidelines, the NCCN guidelines, of which many of us or contributors, you know, the first step, which is clear, and, and internationally there's, there's no dispute about this, is control of the hematocrit. Probably the single most important part that all PVR patients need to have is a hematocrit controlled under 45%. Now, there may be modifications to that. There may be some patients who do a little better, a little lower than that. So you have to have good common clinical sense in terms of their phenotype or symptoms. Uh, there's discussion whether that level should be a little lower in women, although there's really probably not rock-solid evidence around a, a number for that. But clearly under 45%, whether that is through phlebotomy or medication or, or some combination therein. Second is a low-dose aspirin. And although that seems very uh, intuitive, uh, even when I was training, aspirin had been felt to be contraindicated. There had been early studies in the 60s. High doses of aspirin were used. There was higher risk of GI bleeding. So for a long time, it was felt to be contraindicated, but likely was an issue of dose. So now low-dose aspirin through randomized studies uh, from European studies where they use 100 milligrams versus the more U.S. common 81 milligrams, but really as a standard. So really view that all p patients all have hematocrit control, all have low-dose aspirin. The real trickier decision-making is regarding the initiation of cytotoxic therapy, which at the current time includes hydroxyurea uh, and in frequent guidelines, potentially the use of interferon. But in terms of cytoreductive therapy, who benefits from cytoreductive therapy? The guidelines vary a little bit on this. The group that is by far the most clear are people that have had prior thrombotic events or vascular events. That is by far the most clear. Regardless of age, regardless of other things, if you've already had one, you're clearly at greater risk of having another. So that is the clearest. Second is the issue of increasing age in terms of benefiting from that. Is that 60? Is that 65? Is that a, a physiologic 60? Uh, I think that there's more, more dispute, but without question, Aging is a factor, our vessels age, our risk factors for developing events age, and sometimes the first event that you have is a catastrophic one. So uh, I think we take those very, very seriously. Then there is a group of potential indications for cytoreduction that are a bit more gray, but are important to consider. Uh, adequate control of symptoms, uh, intolerance of phlebotomy, uh, alone as a management strategy. Some patients just don't tolerate cyclical phlebotomy very well. Uh, severe symptoms from the iron deficiency of chronic phlebotomy. So there's a range of things in there. 
there's clearly variable risk of cardiovascular health that contribute to it. You know, the 58-year-old that has hypercholesterolemia, hypertension, and two stents, you know, is in a very different position than the person that has pristine cardiovascular health, you know, in their 50s or things of that nature. So that's another uh, important component uh, as well. Uh, so I think if I see an unmet need in terms of the patients that I see referred is frequently around that decision point of going from phlebotomy and aspirin to the initiation of therapy. Uh, and that there's frequently uh, people who should have been started initial therapy are not. 